Well, welcome to FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have Mark Higgins, CAO, Chief Analytics Officer, and co-founder of Beacon. Beacon is a company that provides cloud solutions to financial institutions to better basically run their data and analytics and any number of other interesting and high-level things that we're going to get into. And with that, here's my interview with Mark. Mark, thanks for taking the time today. Thanks for having me. So Mark Higgins of Beacon, tell us about Beacon. Sure. So Beacon is a financial technology company focused on the capital markets. So these are the sort of wholesale trading that happens in foreign exchange and commodities and interest rate derivatives and things like that. And what we sell is a combination of two things. On the one side is a derivatives trading and risk management system. And the other the other side is a development platform that's kind of part of that risk management system that lets our clients, developer teams, build their own tools that run right alongside ours. Yeah, that's more so what I was getting at with my introduction, but we'll talk about both platforms. So talk to me about how Beacon came to be. Sure. So my co-founder, uh, who's a guy named Kirat Singh, he and I spent our careers uh, working. I'm, I'm a quant. He's a developer. And we worked together on trading desks at uh, initially at Goldman Sachs and then at JP Morgan. And then my co-founder, Kirat, went to Bank of America as well, basically working, building technology for uh, for these trading desks. So that's like they do these sort of complicated derivatives deals that, you know, might be many years in duration. And they need some sort of system to kind of keep track of all the deals that they've done, as well as like keeping track of how much money they make or lose every day, where they made or lost money. They'll look at things like what are the risks of my portfolio, which is like if different parts of the market move by certain amounts, how much money am I going to make or lose so they can understand kind of how to hedge themselves. So it's that kind of stuff. So a system to kind of keep track of these complicated derivatives trades and value them. So Kirat and I started working on these trading desks and we started at Goldman Sachs, which has an internal system called SecDB, which is a pretty interesting system. It's, it was different than a lot of the other bank systems in how it approached development on the trading desk, right? So if you think about developers on the desk, there's broadly kind of two kinds. There's the technology department who are really good at enterprise technology, right? Like how do you organize large amounts of data and, you know, coordinate teams of developers and make changes to your production trading and risk system without blowing everything up. Like all that kind of stuff is enterprise technology. And the technology department's really good at that stuff. But often they end up being a little bit far from the, the, the kind of pointy end of the business stick. Then there's a second group of developers, which are like quants or data scientists or financial engineers, front office developers. I'm going to use quants as a word to describe that whole group. And what they're good at is this solving business problems as they come up on the desk using whatever tools they have available. They're typically not very good at enterprise technology, but they're good at sort of understanding the business side. That's a bit of a problem though. If you're working at like a big institution where there's a production system that has to be up all the time because people are managing their risks as the market's moving around, you have to be kind of careful about how you change it. You have to respect all that enterprise technology stuff. And quants typically can't, they just don't know how to do that very well. And so one of two things typically happens. One is someone on the trading desk says, I don't know what those technology department guys are doing. They don't really understand my business very well. Quants, you do. So why don't you build my new risk system? And then the quant will like open Excel, and build a bunch of stuff in Excel. And another person will download Python and build some stuff in Python. And another person builds like a C++ analytics library. And you end up with all these little point solutions all over the place that solve the business problem that's right in front of them at the time that they're uh, presented with it. But then, you know, a few years down the road, you've got hundreds of these little point solutions that are all kind of disconnected and with functionality and data duplicated all over the place. And that's like the, the spreadsheet trap that a lot of people tend to fall into because they're not aware of this thing where that quants aren't good enterprise developers. So at a lot of places to avoid that trap, the, the kind of organizational model that places have fallen into is one where the job of a quant is just to build an analytics library. And then they hand it off to their friends in technology who kind of like plumb it into the applications and deploy it to production and do all the hard enterprise technology stuff. And that model works, but it's just not very efficient. Uh, the quants kind of have this, this group of technology people in between them and their users. So it tends to push them away from the business a bit. The quants and tech people don't quite speak the same language. So all sorts of bureaucracy accrues to that process. And the quants have outsourced the most important thing that any developer can do, which is deploy your change into production. No trade on a trading desk cares a pip about what you're doing in an R&D environment. They just only care when they can actually get their hands on it to you know, do a new deal or calculate risk in a new way or something. So what Goldman did with SecDB uh, was to say, we're going to start our trading and risk management system as a development platform that has all that enterprise technology stuff in it. 
so that quants and data scientists and people like that don't have to be expert at expert at enterprise technology to be able to be sort of fully fledged developers working in the production environment. And what it meant was Goldman could just be, could, Goldman could have a better organization model, one where the quants and tech people are sort of peers with each other, building their own slices of the stack, everything from analytics all the way up to, to applications and production deployment and stuff. And that was just a better model in the sense that if there was a new type of financial product that was created, Goldman could just be faster than everyone else in building a proper representation of it that you could both price a new deal and book it in your trading system and manage risk on it and have it feed into all the accounting systems and all the kind of back office gunk that you have to do with real deals. So that's Goldman. Talk to me about what you did. <laughs> yeah. So I was a quant on the FX and the race desks there, kind of working in SecDB. So Kirat, my co-founder at Beacon, was like building that core platform. And I was a quant that was like building the trading and risk management stuff in it. So we spent like eight years uh, doing that at Goldman together. And uh, then in 2006, Kirat and I moved together to JP Morgan to build something called Athena, which was sort of like version two of that SecDB style architecture. So, you know, we, though we had the advantage of using modern technology as of 2006 and mm -hmm. realizing all the stuff with hindsight that we'd done wrong in SecDB and fix it up the second time. It's always uh, better the second time. Always better the second time. So we did that four years together at JP Morgan uh, and Athena is still there as you know, the most important strategic risk system at the bank. Uh, in 2010, Kirat went to Bank of America to start Quartz, which is like version three of this thing, right? So he spent four years kind of building it there. I stayed at JP Morgan, uh, ended up co-heading the quantitative research group, so like the quant group for the investment bank, and then moved into trading. I was running the electronic market making business for currency options for a couple of years. I uh, realized I wasn't a particularly good trader. And uh, then was talking to Kirat, who just left Bank of America. And we were like, you know, we've done this three times before. Why don't we... Uh, when we just make a company to do it. So that's kind of where Beacon came from. It's the synthesis of the kind of technology uh, architecture that we'd grown up with at Goldman and then built again at JP Morgan and Bank of America, and now have built for kind of the, you know, the final time in, in Beacon. Excellent. So bottom line is you didn't start from zero. You actually, this is the fourth version, more or less, of, exactly. of the same thing. So you've gotten all the bugs out at the expense of all the biggest players in the, in the world. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So so talk to me about, uh, I mean, when we first talked, I basically kind of described you as something that sits over top of AWS, or for lack of a better term, as a management and development platform. Is that that's about right, correct? Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, every time we do this, we change the technology somehow and update it. So when we did Beacon, and we made it all run in the cloud, you know, initially on AWS yeah. at Amazon and have expanded out into, you know, Microsoft Azure and the Google Cloud and stuff. But the idea there was financial institutions have had this sort of, you know, 30 plus year history of on-premise data center compute. And there's a particular kind of like mental model that goes along with that, which is like, I buy some computers and then I have the, you know, six months later, they are, they're actually ready to go. And then I have those computers for three years until they appreciate and then I can get more, but it's like a six month lag to get new compute. Whereas the cloud is like, I have this infinitely deep ocean of compute that I can dip into as deep as I like whenever I want, take out as much as I want, rent it while I use it and then chuck it back when I'm done. The kind of, this kind of elastic compute model. And our clients have a, have, aren't used to that kind of model. And so one thing that we help our clients with, with Beacon, is how to use the cloud the right way. Because Beacon sort of automates all that you know, cloud infrastructure management and elastic compute stuff. So our clients don't have to be experts at it. So you basically abstracted the layer that, basic, that, that they would have otherwise had to master at AWS or Azure or wherever else. And given them a familiar interface for what they're dealing with. Exactly right. Yep. yep. Excellent. Okay. So, and I mean, looking at your website also, I mean, it looks, uh, at least what I see of the UI, looks very approachable. You have certain things that basically look like an Excel spreadsheet that as a means of input or or working with the software. So we think definitely, it sounds like you've done what you could, can to diminish the learning curve of getting on your platform as much as possible. Is that safe to say? Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, Part of running the cloud is that your user interface is almost always web applications. And so, you know, we were sort of the beneficiaries of a really mature web application world that we're, that we're working in right now. So we, you know, pulled a lot of that in and built on top of it and made a, you know, a pretty slick user interface for the stuff that we deliver, right? So remember our platform, our, our product is this combination of two pieces. One of them is sort of an out of the box set of trading and risk management applications that, you know, traders and salespeople and portfolio managers and people like that at our clients can just take and use out of the box and do a lot of uh, important stuff. But all these businesses are ones that 
have a lot of customization, right? That each, each place does things a little bit different and they want to be able to customize it. And so the second part of our platform is the developer environment where they can go and build you know, their own tools. So if they want to go and take all that same cool web application technology that we use to build our applications, they can go and use it to build their own applications that run right alongside ours in the same framework. That's one of the things that really distinguishes us from, from other companies, I think, is that we're very open with our underlying technology and development environment. Our clients get all of our source code. They can write their own code in the environment. It's not just like a set of APIs. It's the actual development environment and all the developer tools that we use that makes it easy for them to go and customize it. Good. I mean, and that's that's one of the biggest points of friction I often talk about when it comes, it comes to technology deployment and when how it fails is too often firms don't spend or don't want to spend enough time investing in training in these things. Then the way to minimize the impact of that is to give them something as familiar as possible. So it makes sense. So this is where you've taken it thus far. Talk to me about uh, how the products evolved since you started it. I mean, it's evolved in four iterations. You launched the market with this, but I'm sure, again, the old saying is no plant survives uh, first encounter with the enemy. Tell me how you ended up having to modify and adapt this product that you didn't expect to initially. Yeah, I mean, that was that was actually, I think, one of the toughest things about our product is that it can be so broad. Fundamentally, you know, our thing, you know, is meant to represent all the workflows and analytics that people do across the different asset classes that people trade stuff. So whether that's, you know, foreign exchange, exchange trading, all the complicated exotic derivatives that trade in that market, or if it's commodities trading and clients who are have bought the right to run a gas-fired power plant and want to be able to manage that effectively. So it's really broad and there's a lot of stuff we could do. We'd already built this thing like three times before at the banks. And so we kind of knew in our head the, the, you know, a lot of the details for what we wanted to build in all those different bids. And the trick was just finding clients who would pay us to build something. And so in the early years of the company, we spent a lot of time being pretty reactive from a product perspective where, you know, basically our roadmap was whatever the next big prospect wanted us to build. So it kept changing all the time. So that was one of the one of the trickiest things. We ended up uh, being kind of scattered from a product perspective early on. Uh, and it's taken us, us a few years to kind of, you know, switch that mindset from the kind of reactive approach to, to product management to a more strategic one that we're that we're doing now. Good. I have to stay adaptive. All right. So talk to me about, um, I mean, this is this is a big change for people. Like what is the implementation timeline for something like this look like? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, it depends a little bit on how deep they go. So for most clients, it'll be two or three months, something like that, until they have something that they can put their hands on and start using. And then it might be another few months uh, to get all the data integration hooked up after that. So usually sort of six months until people are, are productive with it. But, you know, it's six months. And also there's a lot of sort of complexity in the underlying developer tools. There's just a lot of stuff in there. So the, there's a lot of training that goes uh, hand in hand with this. And that used to be all just done manually by our, uh, you know, team of internal consultants. Nowadays, we've, you know, we've automated a lot of that. So built a lot of great online documentation and training videos and learning paths and things. That said, we still do a lot of uh, handholding with our clients as they get up to speed with our product. Excellent. So you've, I mean, this all sounds good. Talk to me about the, you have some pretty impressive KPI metrics on, on improvements. So what are the, what's the payoff in the end here? Yeah. I mean, I think the, yeah, here's, I think one of the one of the ways to think about this is in terms of the value of this elastic compute uh, functionality that you get from using the cloud. As an example, we have uh, one client who's a bank who represents a, you know a complicated cross asset portfolio in Beacon and uses it for pricing and risk management and that sort of stuff. At the beginning of the pandemic, all of a sudden everyone was like, "Oh my God, you know what might happen to markets through this really complicated event that the modern markets have never lived through before." So they had a whole bunch of different scenarios that they wanted to, you know, kind of run their portfolios through and figure out, mm -hmm. um, you know, how they perform in those scenarios. And these are big portfolios with, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of individual positions in them. Each one of those things can be pretty expensive to calculate, you know, price and risk numbers for. So this ends up being like a big distributed risk calculation, a thing where you would break it up into a whole bunch of little chunks and then run all those chunks in parallel on a big pool of compute. So with this client at the beginning of the pandemic, they were like, I, we've got all these, all these scenarios that we want to run our portfolio through. And if they hadn't been using Beacon in the cloud, they would have been a bit stuck because all the compute that they have on hand is already being used by the business. So they can't say like, I need like 2000 cores to go and run some big calculation on. Yeah, you can't They're spin already up in use. quick unless you're on some sort of massive data server like an AWS or, AM, or Azure. Yeah, I mean, 
I mean, like a like an on-premise data center for a business like this might have ten thousand cores available for doing calculations. You know, anywhere for, depends on the business, one thousand to ten thousand or something. But they're in use all the time by the regular business staff. And so, if you wanted to do that scenario analysis, you'd have to you know wait for a weekend when everyone was out. But you still have that compute because you bought it and you have it all the time. Then you start a calculation running on the weekend, and then like halfway through it breaks and you don't notice until the next day. And then the whole thing needs to get rerun. And then it, instead of being a quick thing, it takes like three weeks to do. With Beacon though, they could just say, I want to on the fly spin up 2000 new cores. They're just brand new ones on the side, don't, don't affect the production business and go run their scenarios, which they ran in about an hour and a half, cost them about a hundred dollars. And then they gave those 2000 cores back. So this gives you a lot more fle flexibility in doing these kind of ad hoc analyses because you have access to Elastic Compute. So that's just one example of the way that, that our and clients- something that didn't exist before. And I, I think yeah. on prem, like, what are you going to do? You're not going to go, you're not going to go buy and install all the server capacity. Like, yeah, you said it, like it was run yeah. overnight. And even then even if you wanted to, it would, it would take a month to get the budget sign off and then, you know, another month month to order it from your computer supplier and another two months for the computers to get delivered to the data center and put in the racks and then another month for people to like manually log in and set up the computers. With the Elastic Compute stuff, it's all automated though. And it takes like three minutes to spin up all those computers. Yeah, no doubt. So basically that you're enabling them to work faster, better, smarter, in addition to yep. the entire... You know, that, that's one thing that I never would have, that I didn't think about initially until you mentioned it. And I'm sure many of them, and they know the pain internally. The entire scalability of the thing at speed, that's something that they never had before. What's What's been their reactions once they've gotten integrated into this and, and been you know working with it for about six, seven months? It's really transformative. Like, um, I mean, part of it is the ability to get elastic compute and solve problems like the one we were talking about. But the bigger part of it is that it just lets the, you know, these, you know, these developers who are like quants really mm -hmm. be peers with their technologist friends. And so it means that when they have a problem that they want to work on, they can just go and get into the developer tools and go and build it themselves right away. It'll take, you know, and then deploy it to production in a way that satisfies all the control policies that they have to satisfy that's already automatically built in. So they don't have to be awesome in enterprise technology that to work in the production environment. So they can just do stuff a lot faster. And that's what, you know, really shines when, when our clients have it landed and start and start getting productive in it. They can just do a lot of stuff. And it's exciting. Like one of the financial metrics we look at is like, how much do existing clients grow their use of Beacon? And it's pretty high. It's like 20, 30% a year, most years, because you know, they'll start using Beacon for one particular thing, whatever particular business problem yeah. we've, you know, we found as we approached them and, and did the sale. Their developers start using Beacon to build new stuff for the desk and love it. And then a new project comes up and they're like, why don't we just use Beacon for this? And then they, they expand their use for Beacon. And that's kind of like the, the vision we have for the company, right? That if you're a developer in capital markets, working with Beacon is just way, it's just way better than the way you were doing it before. In almost every case, it's like... um. Uh, traders and Bloomberg terminals, right? Like every trader is going to get a Bloomberg terminal. Of course, they're way better than all the other things that are out there. And we want Beacon to be like that for developers, right? Sort of the operating system for capital markets, because it's just a better set of tools for doing the job you were doing before. Yeah. And insert joke about Excel usage here. You know, well, it'd be nice to see <laughs> nice to see the world get off of being run by spreadsheets that are by nature brittle. Anyway, such is life. So Mark, uh, three questions to end before we wrap up. First one is if you had one wish for something you could change in your company or the industry as a whole, what would it be? I think it would be probably having people be sort of understand better what it means to use the cloud. You know, I think one of the one of the hard things we have about sales that we do is that our clients in capital, you know, whether it's the buy side or sell side, they all know that the cloud is the future and that they got to get stuff onto the cloud, but it's hard for them to kind of get their head around it. Like I was saying before, this, this sort of metaphor shift changes everything about how you do stuff. It changes yeah. everything down to like, you know, how you do network security and things. It changes everything. So I guess if there was one wish I had, it was that people were further along in that, in that sort of understanding. So it would be easier to sell it to them and get them further down the road to moving onto the cloud. Yeah. And it's... Um... You know, it's not a small institutional shift. Right? I mean, you think about all the jobs and ecosystems and processes that are basically developed around even just like you said, the approval process alone is substantial. We're talking, you're talking about changing a core underlying technology. Yeah, you know, and there's that, I'm sure you're familiar with the, uh, what's it called? The Lindy principle, which the longer you're dependent upon something, the more likely you are dependent upon it in the future. Breaking that cycle <laughs> is difficult. You know, there's a reason why all securities are traded or basically custodied on 1960s and 1970s technology. Uh-huh. 
And I want to pull uh, my hair out every time I think about that. People st- still talk about mainframes. Remember when I, I first got to banks and people said that there was a mainframe and I'm like, are you joking? Oh, I know. I, there are, just, there, there are still mainframes there. I always, I always laugh and think to myself, like, imagine you were the person who was like on your first day, you helped install that into the banking system <laughs> and, and you're, and you're sitting there and you're in your eighties or nineties now. And you're like, what do you mean they're still using that <laughs> server that I installed in the seventies and, and it's still and calling you still in COBOL. Crazy. And how is this? And the reason you'd be, he'd be saying that is because people, someone would be trying to get them out of retirement to keep on writing code yeah. because yeah, un- unbelievable. Whew. Anyway, COBOL is a running joke on this show. The second question, oh, what has been the biggest challenge getting the company to where it is today? You know, I think the, the thing that we didn't properly understand about selling to big institutions is that it's really hard to sell to them when you're a little company. Like when we started, it was just me and Kirat. And we had some credibility because of what we'd done before. But it's still like we're a little company with two people. We had a few consultants working for us. We thought it would be easy to sell to big institutions, but it was hard. And we were lucky. Our first client is a company called Global Atlantic, which recently got bought by KKR, which is a life insurance company. It used to be a Goldman's New York reinsurance business. And so we knew some of the people from our Goldman days. And in 2013, they split out as a separate company and bought some retail life insurers and became a life insurer. And they had the right to use Goldman's internal system for like two years years after they split off and then they had to get off of it. And so our first job, they actually hired us as consultants to help them manage the project of getting off of SecDB. And we said, you know, well, we're building a thing that's just like SecDB. It doesn't exist yet, but would you like to buy it when we're done? And they built up some trust with us through the consulting stuff. And so they did. They ended up being our first enterprise client, which was a huge boost to our credibility as a company, you know, getting that, that first client. So I just wanted to give a shout out to our friends at Global Atlantic. They've been awesome. They helped us get going. They're investors in the company uh, and they've been great partners all the way through. Excellent. Yes. The old saying, no one gets fired for hiring IBM or Microsoft still exactly. is true to exactly. this day. It's, yep. uh, yeah, it's it's the common question. You know, at the end of the day, you hire you hire the unknown little player and something doesn't go right. And that's the excuse to get rid of the person who made that decision, quite honestly. Exactly. Exactly. Ah, it is what it is. All right. Last question. What excites you the most about what it is you're working on and keeps you getting up in the morning to keep on fighting the good fight of building this company? Yeah. I mean, I think it's just the sort of unused productivity that's out there amongst all these developers and financial services. Like people want to customize things. They want that. Like I don't, for the clients that we go after, I don't think like a low code approach really works. There's the, you know, it's really complicated enough that you have teams of developers who are really crucial to the functioning of the business whether they're quants or the technology department, and they just don't do it very well. Like in general, the sort of most common model in the street just isn't very efficient for having those people deliver value to the business. So Mm -hmm. I just love the idea of helping, you know, the whole industry kind of, you know, get more efficient and productive through using better tools. Mark, thank you so much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. I love it. Thank you very much for having me on. So as Mark Higgins of Beacon, hope you enjoyed that. And if you are a listener who's on one of these desks who feels this pain, by all means, please check out Beacon. As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. And until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca.